It's my pleasure to welcome you to the State Line Seventh-day Adventist Church today. And um, I see we have uh, some visitors, and um, we're happy for that. We welcome you back. And we welcome those who are joining us uh, through the internet or live stream or um, some sort of that way. And uh, we pray that you'll be abundantly and richly blessed as we worship together today. Our speaker this morning is Fred McFarland, one of our local elders here at the State Line Church. His topic is a king's love. If you'd like to open your Bibles, let's uh, take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. Our scripture reading is 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Well, I want to say amen to that beautiful music. It looks like I have a little more time to speak today. We'll see what we can do with that. <clears throat> I 
There are some that when they share the gospel, the first place they go in the Bible is where? Some New Testament, usually. So what we're going to do today for this Sabbath is we're going to look at the gospel in the Old Testament in a story that you're very familiar with, with King David and Mephibosheth. But before we get started, I'd like to have a word of prayer, just a brief word of prayer. Dearest Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be gathered in this morning on your special day. And we thank you for stories like this, that you can touch our hearts and show us the salvific elements that are a part of our lives as well. Help us to resonate with this story as your Holy Spirit takes us uh, through these components, these elements, Lord, of these verses, and help us to speak to our hearts. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin with verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. So that's 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And we're going to go back and forth. We're going to run our fingers to and fro in the scriptures. So you want to either take a piece of paper or take your finger and keep it in that place in particular because we're going to keep coming back continuously to 2 Samuel chapter 9. So let's look at verse 1. <clears throat> and David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now we have to consider David, King David's position here. He has... <laughs> He certainly has military strength, and he subdued the Philistines. He has control of their capital city, their garrison, or their fortifications. He's conquered the Moabites, the Syrians in Damascus. He's conquered the Edomites, and here he is in a position of control through the power of God. But with this military strength also comes wealth. In status. So King David was powerful in this point also. Now he is noted as one of the nine worthies, and perhaps you've heard of this expression before the nine worthies. This expression has been coined by Jacques de Longuyon of Lorraine, France. He was a composer of the 14th century. He was a romantic, and his work that has this expression in it, the nine worthies, is entitled, The Vows of the Peacock. Now this is caught on during the Renaissance period, and we'll just show a few here, but you can see where the, they have portrayed the worthies, the nine worthies, and David is in the midst of them. Now this one here, they say that this is the seventh one, this is David here, with the scepter. So they say that's King David right there. That's in Cologne, Germany. Here's another one in Germany, Nuremberg Square. Here you see King David. I don't have to point to that one, right? You know which, which one King David is? The harp, that's right. So you see King David there. Here's another one here. This didn't come out as well, but it's on a mural, a mural on a wall at Saluzzo, Italy. So we see that 2,500 years approximately later, King David is still remembered as one of the nine worthies, one of the most powerful kings uh, throughout history of the world. Now, David was a powerful king here, but he longed to share his kingdom with someone else, someone, a member from the house of Saul. We also have a king, don't we? A king of the universe. And God longs to share his heavenly kingdom with us. And he shows the length he will go to make that possible by the price that was paid for our redemption, for our sins, through the sacrifice of his son. This demonstrates that our Heavenly Father will do anything it takes to save us. John puts it this way in John chapter 3, verse 16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now save your place in 2 Samuel chapter 9. So put your finger there, put a piece of paper there, and let's go to 2 Peter 
chapter 3. That's 2 Peter chapter 3. And we have the same sentiments here by the Apostle Peter. In verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So David desired to show his kindness to someone left from the house of Saul. Why Saul? What kind of king, what kind of person was Saul? How would you describe him? Not a really good king. And probably most of the time, he was giving David utter misery, chasing him to and fro, doing all these various things uh, of violence. And yet, David shows his kindness to an enemy by wanting to bless someone from the house of Saul. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 states, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, right? So Christ died for us and for those that didn't even want to know him, that wanted to oppose him. Christ died for his enemies. And it reminds me, and I ask the question, am I kind to those who do not like me? Am I able to apply these attributes of God and even King David here who was following God in my own life? In this instance, King David took advantage of the time of peace and prosperity to share with someone from the house of Israel. If there were ever a good time to share the gospel today, it would be right now. There will be a time when we will be sharing the everlasting gospel of Revelation chapter 14 under difficult circumstances. In Testimonies, volume 5, page 46 or 463, we have this quote. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis. Under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances, the warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. So let's make sure that we're sharing today and getting prepared and ready for that time. Because that's going to be a very big challenge for us to share under those kinds of circumstances. So let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, so you want to go back there. Hopefully you saved your place. And we're going to look at verse 2. Verse 2. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziva. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziva? And he said, Thy servant is he. Now, who did David call to him to seek out someone from Saul's house to bless? A servant, right? This servant, Ziva. So Ziva had an opportunity to share in the blessing, the blessing for Mephibosheth. Now, there are many ways that we can play a role in the work in sharing the gospel with others. In fact, one of those ways, which reminds me of David, right? David was a musician and he played the harp. One of those beautiful ways to share the gospel is through music and hymns and praising God. Amen. So I'm going to take a little time with that. So let, turn with me, if you will. Save your place again in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 with me, please. Ephesians chapter 5. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to start out with verse 22, probably get down to 25. I want to share with you a story about this with music. Because music can bless us when we're sharing the gospel. It's a witness to others, but it can also bless us within the church and within our family as well. My sixth year as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I was Bible studying with a man that was a few years older than I am. He was 55 years old, and he was 
studying with me, and we weren't studying at the time, but he gave me a call, and he was having this argument with his wife. So he gave me a call, and he said, Fred, I need you to come down here. I need to come, you to come down here and talk to my wife. <laughs> Not talk to them, talk to, and immediately, what do you think I, I thought? I, here, I was married for two years. Uh, did you talk to your pastor about it? No, I don't like the pastor. It was a different church, but I, I liked that pastor, but I didn't want to argue with him. So I hung up the phone, I told him I'll be over there, and I hung up the phone, I just prayed because I felt I didn't have the experience, I felt inadequate. So I prayed, and while I was over there, as soon as I knocked on the door, I remembered that his wife played piano beautifully, and she had a grand piano. So we sat down together, we prayed together first, and then they sort of let off some steam and went back and forth, and then after, you have to let these things sort of take, run their course, so after that, I took him to Ephesians chapter 5, the text we're at here, and we start at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now right there, the husband was already looking at his wife, and I know he wanted me to stop there. But we went on. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. 25, husbands, love your wives. Now she was looking at him. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So then they started again a little bit. And once they were finished, then we went to verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. So I asked them, do you take time together as a married couple praising God and singing hymns together? Do you get on the piano and sing together? And, and they just sort of looked at each other and couldn't answer that question, or they didn't want to answer that question. But you notice, and I pointed this out to them, verse 19 comes before the relationship. So in other words, other words, what I believe Paul is stating here is if you want to have a healthy relationship, you have to spend time together as a married couple. Amen. So we see how music, hymns, praising God together, and we can put in their prayer as well, is a good way to witness and also strengthen a relationship and witness outside the relationship to others also. But we have a lot more ways to, to worship and be servants for God in spreading the gospel, right? We also have uh, sharing the gospel by simply doing kind acts for others. We see this quintessential example with David, right, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Another way is uh, to have ministries in the church, and we have a wonderful ministry with Sherman and, Sherman and Shoes, uh, dispersing glow tracks and other literature to others, visiting door to door, Bible studying, right? That's a very vibrant ministry. Uh, we can come back to singing again. Uh, we visit the... Um, Regent home at the park and visit elders there and the young people sing. Uh, we have another ministry that's uh, taken off with the Walla Walla uh, Veterans Home and they're singing there. Organizing social events is good because we call some people from the community or those that come to the church intermittently, right? So they can have some fellowship, some friendship. Art is a wonderful way to share the gospel, isn't it? Through art. Sharing the gospel through food. And you could give a sermon on that. I believe uh, Pastor Ash mentioned that one time. You could give a sermon just on sharing the gospel through food, through the Bible. <clears throat> Maybe that's the next sermon. So there are many ways to share the gospel. And God has given, given us a lot of ways and methods in the Bible. So here we see David calling Siva, a servant from the house of Saul. So let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse 3. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. So Ziba points out, there is one lame on his feet that remains from the house of Saul. Now this was interesting because the name of Mephibosheth, I don't know if you've looked at this, 
before, but it means idol breaker or the breaker of idols. I was thinking, who might Mephibosheth represent? So the Bible states that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So before you can become an idol breaker, you have to realize that you have been worshiping idols. Now, some of you may say, well, I have not physically worshiped Baal or any type of idols, but you can simply worship an idol by worshiping yourself. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and nudging you about a particular thing and you reject the voice of the Holy Spirit, well, what are we doing? We're putting ourselves before the Spirit of God. Now, does God desires to clean us up. But to do that, we have to admit, confess our sins, and realize that we are in the same shoes, in a sense, as Mephibosheth. But God wants us to be an idol breaker, or idol breakers. Now, the servant describes Mephibosheth as lame on his feet. Now, when Mephibosheth was five years old, the Philistines were attacking Jezreel, and Saul was losing really bad, and they were fleeing from the Philistines. And then the nurse that was taking care of Mephibosheth, I'm surmising, probably picked him up and was running with him. She was in a hurry, fleeing for her life, and accidentally dropped him at five years old, so his ankles were probably pretty tender, or his feet. And we don't know exactly what happened and how he got along, but we certainly know he was lame on his feet, and that affected him for the rest of his life. He was handicapped, and it was extremely difficult for him to get around. And we can empathize with him in verse 8 when he calls himself a dead dog. Now, the phrase dead in the Hebrew, muth, literally means to be put to death for unwise moral choices. That packs a lot, that word, doesn't it? Unwise moral choices to be put to death. So we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what is the wages of sin? Death. Death. So for our unwise moral choices, we are guilty before the throne of God. Just like Mephibosheth may have been guilty for some things before King David. Now in spite of this condition, he came to the king and he was blessed, Mephibosheth. Now, without Jesus, we are spiritually handicapped, aren't we? Unable to walk the path of righteousness. We are dead dogs. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, puts it this way. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Mephibosheth came before the king with humility and said, I am a dead dog. And friends, we have to come before the throne of God through Jesus with humiliation and realize that without Christ, we're dead dogs. <clears throat> we have to confess, I am a sinner, and we need forgiveness from Jesus. And if we, ex if we have Jesus in our hearts, if we yield to him, then we're reconciled to God, and we have the position now where he can cut out idolatry from our hearts, Right? We can break idolatry through the, through the power of God. There was a drug bust in which some police officers and a SWAT team came to this residence, and they already knew what was happening, so they broke down the door and they went in there, and they were looking for the different drugs. And there was one particular police officer that was in the kitchen, and he was walking around. And he could hear this whimpering in the kitchen. So he opened up the refrigerator. He heard it coming from the refrigerator. He opened up the refrigerator, and there was this paper bag with blood on it. And he looked inside the paper bag, and there was this little pit bull puppy. And evidently what was happening is they had this pit bull fights in the backyard. Not just the drugs are going on, but these actual pit bull fights in the back, and they were making revenue from these fights between these pit bulls, and they were obviously using this puppy as bait. So they weren't sure what to do about this whole situation, so they took the puppy back to the police department and figured they would try to rehab him, and hopefully he would come through. And so they waited for six months, 
and he was well, and he did good, he healed up, and they thought, maybe we can put him on the canine team. Maybe he can become maybe one of these dogs that can sniff out drugs as some of the other ones. And you know what happened? He became the top canine dog in the whole department. In fact, he set a precedence, a precedence with his um, heroics. So I want to show you a picture. This isn't the actual puppy, but he thinks he's pretty cool there. <laughs> but you see him there. And so they're using pit bulls now on police forces, canine dogs, which is very interesting. So the pit bull was saved from death, but he was also transformed. He was cleaned up inside. Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Death. Jesus saves us from death. He makes things right between the Father, the heavenly kingdom, and us. And then he changes our lives. He transforms us, right? Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Again, save your place in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We'll be visiting there again, revisiting. So Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Some of you probably already have this memorized. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we're reconciled to God, justification, he forgives us our sins. The penalty that we deserve, he takes it upon himself. When we come to him, we confess our sins, and we receive him as our savior, and then he cleans us up. Sanctification. So you see both elements there in verse 10 of Romans chapter 5, justification and sanctification. Well, let's go back again to verses 4 and 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 9. So verses 4 and 5. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Siva said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, son of Emil in Lodavar. The king de and then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil, from Lodavar. Now, why was Mephibosheth residing at this man's place? Why was he there? Now, what's interesting is if you go further, we won't take a look there, but in Psalm, or not Psalm rather, but 2 Samuel chapter 17, remember when Absalom is pursuing his father, right? He wants to just put his lights out. And so King David, they're thirsty, they're hungry. Well, this particular sir, uh, merchant man here, Machiu, was there to help provide provisions for King David and his soldiers. They gave him beds, plenty of water, and took care of them. So this salesman, that's what his name means, salesman. Machiu means salesman. He was, must have been a very successful merchant very wealthy to be able to provide all those provisions for David and his soldiers. So it's possible that Mephibosheth was there for protection and also maybe a buffer between other enemies that may want to uh, completely put the lights out of Mephibosheth. Maybe he was hiding from David. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. What was going on in Mephibosheth's mind during this time? Think about that for a moment. Now remember, his brother, Ishbosheth, was assassinated. Now, of course, David did not support that act. In fact, he had those men executed. But we don't know if Mephibosheth knew that or if he knew what was happening, if he could put things together. You know, I, he probably didn't even know, he probably wasn't realizing what David's character was like. So here his brother's assassinated. He is the last candidate for the throne of Saul's line. Now, if David wipes him out, there is no threat of a possible rival. Perhaps this was going on in Mephibosheth's mind when he fell on his face before the king and he stated, Behold thy servant, 
he may have probably been afraid of death or the possible outcome right before the king. Does God want us to serve him out of fear? No. He doesn't want us to serve him out of fear. Let's take a Savior place again. Let's look at Luke, Luke chapter 5. Luke 5, and you know this story right well, Luke chapter 5. So we know in the Gospels here, Peter, James, and John were expert fishermen, commercial fishermen. We know the story. They were fishing all night. And the next morning, they didn't catch anything. And their master, Jesus Christ, told them, he was at the shore, he said, cast your net again. And when Jesus asks you to do something, what do you do? do, you do they do it. They, they, you do it. And that's what they did. They cast their net, or they cast their net again, listening to Jesus. And then we have verse 8. Remember, they caught so much fish, two things happened. The boat began to sink, and the net began to tear. And now we have verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That sounds like Mephibosheth, possibly. For he was astonished in all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. And Jesus went further than that, right? Jesus said, you're also going to catch men. In other words, he was saying, Peter, it's good to be where you're at, at my feet. And I'm going to change you where people see me in you, and you're going to draw them to the heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> Let's turn back to Samuel chapter 9, because we have a similar situation here in Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. What was the first thing that David said to Mephibosheth? And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So there's a restoration here, a restoration process that David was a part of with the household of Saul. Now through sin, we lost our real estate, didn't we? We lost the Garden of Eden. But there will be a re restoration process for the people of God. Amen? amen. Can you say amen? amen? That'll be a wonderful time. And in fact, Revelation chapter 21, you don't have to turn there, but in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it states that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Right? So David continues in verse 7, and he says, And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And we just celebrated this last Sabbath, but Jesus, while he was having communion supper with his apostles before he was going to go to the cross, he stated in Matthew 26, verse 29, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's house, in my Father's kingdom. So there's a promise there that we'll be able to sit with Jesus and eat with him, eat bread and drink from the vine, right? The new wine. The good stuff, right? And you know what I mean by the good stuff, right? The stuff that's pure. Amen. Okay, non-fermented. We want to get that straight. <laughs> okay, so Jesus is going to take us home. And we're going to have a marriage supper with our Savior, celebrating the grand plan of salvation. Now, can you imagine the relief that Mephibosheth must have experienced when he heard those words, fear not, and all the, the words that David continued to state in that verse, verse 7. Now let's just focus on Mephibosheth one more time and his background. He must have had a miserable life. Think about it. So from five years old to this time in this discourse with David, he is severely handicapped. More than likely, his friends probably ignored him. He certainly couldn't go outside and run outdoors and, and play with his friends. Uh, you know how kids can be sometimes? They may have made fun of him. They may have thought he was a uh, despicable character and they didn't want to spend time with him. 
He faced wars and rumors of wars. He survived a horrible war and devastation. His father was slain. His grandfather was viciously mocked and put to death. In fact, his grandfather, Saul, had a lot of problems. And believe me, that must have got around Jerusalem as well. And it comes as no surprise that Mephibosheth would refer to himself as a dead dog. Think about that. All of those, those situations that he was involved in growing up. But the king blessed him, and what a relief this must have been to this poor man. And it doesn't matter what your condition may be, what our condition may be as sinners, God can forgive us if we surrender to him just the way we are, and then he'll change us. He'll change the way we are. But we can come to him, can't we? We don't have to fix ourselves up, do anything special, just come to Jesus the way we are, and he will clean us up. He will change us. Now David, did David receive a blessing by demonstrating empathy towards Mephibosheth? Did he receive a blessing? Turn to your elders page, elders page in your bulletin, and we have an excerpt here from Testimonies, Volume 4, page 56. Testimonies 4, page 56. And it states, When human sympathy is blended with love and benevolence and sanctified by the Spirit of Jesus, it is an element which can be productive of great good. Those who are thus working are obeying a law of heaven and will receive the approval of God. The pleasure of doing good to others imparts a glow to the feelings which flashes through the nerves, quickens the circulation of the blood, and induces mental and physical health. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That means sharing God's word is healthy for us. So if someone asks you, why do you waste your time sharing God's word? You can say, it's good for my health, <laughs> right? It's good for your health. It's invigorating. Helps us live longer, gives us some longevity. Now, what gave David this burning desire to bless Mephibosheth? What gave him this burning desire? I'm going to say the Spirit of God. And why I state that is because of his prayer. But before he prayed, we know that David himself, unfortunately, and I'm sure some of us would like to take those chapters back, but a few chapters later, he himself gets involved in deep rebellion. He takes a spiritual nosedive, and he gets involved in debauchery. But his prayer tells us where his power to do right came from in the book of Psalms. So let's look at Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51, verses 10 to 11. Psalm 51, verses 10 to 11. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So David knew the power of the Spirit's influence, and we get a deep sense of this in his prayer. But there are those brothers and sisters who do not understand the power of the Spirit. And we believe, or these folk believe, politicians and others, that to have a utopian society, a society of equality for all, you've heard this before, right? I'm sure you have. Uh, equality for all, we must legislate. Now, of course, laws exist to maintain a certain moral compass, to protect society from those who would violate certain human rights. But when people are forced to give their money to others who are less fortunate to promote economic equality, you're going to encounter some difficulties. You know what I mean? You're going to have some problems. U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, who ran for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2015, I'm sure you're aware of him, he had a few words to say about this. Unbelievable and grotesquely the top one-tenth of one percent owns nearly as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. So these are his sentiments on this particular website. 
We must not accept a nation in which billionaires compete as to the size of their super yachts while children in America go hungry and veterans sleep out on the streets. Now, as Christians, we can resonate with this, can't we? I mean, we can, we can empathize with these sentiments. But democratic socialism means that in a democratic civilized society, the wealthiest people and the largest corporations must pay their fair share of taxes. Now, I have a few questions about this. Now, I do believe that taxes are important and that we need certain programs to help people temporarily get back on their feet. Do you agree with that? I, I think that we need that. But we need to be careful when we're tipping the scale. Does that make sense? Because you can't, how do you legislate kindness? That's what we're talking about. If you're not going to be kind, we're going to force it upon you. So we have to be careful politically. It's a very delicate balance. Am I making sense? Yes. Now we have the other side of the spectrum, the political spectrum. Frustrated with the moral degeneration of society, legislators believe this country should get back to God. And we, can, we could agree with those sentiments, right? Yes. If this country sincerely got back to God, at least the majority or half of the citizens here in the United States, what kind of country would this be? Okay, but it's not necessarily getting back to God, it's the method that you use to do it. Amen. So having this thought is not a bad idea, but how you propose to do it is a major concern for me, and po possibly for you too. A member of the Arizona State Senate, Sylvia Allen stated, how we get back to a moral rebirth in this country, I don't know since we are eroding religion at every opportunity that we have. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. Well, what happens if we legislate this Sunday observance what happens to those that are irreligious? Are those that choose to be atheists? Are you going to force them to go to church? And what about those that worship on Friday or worship on Saturday or don't want to go to church and just want to worship God at home? Are you going to legislate that for them as well? So we need to be careful with legislation. In fact, I'm more afraid of the latter than the former. I'm not sure how you feel about that. Okay, because it touches on people's dictates of their conscience. And you shouldn't tamper with people's conscience, especially how they worship through legislation. Amen. Can we get amen on that? How many agree with that? Now, the reason why, because ultimate, the ultimate decision, uh, solution, and I understand these perplexities as well as you do, um, but the ultimate solution for these moral problems really lies with the work of the Spirit. It's an inside job. Right. You can't legislate that. Amen. And I believe that the professed Christians, state that follow Jesus here in America, if we would really follow Jesus sincerely, trust him with all our heart, with all our hearts, I think this nation would change. So I think the first thing we need to do, instead of thinking of legislation, we need to think of a total transformation in our lives as professed Christians. So King David desires to show kindness to Mephibosheth for whose sake? We're back on verse 7 again. For Jonathan's sake. Now this is one point that is emphasized in this passage. And I'm, I'm cataloging some of these verses and I'm going to mention the phrases here. Verse 1, I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. You have verse 3, Jonathan hath yet a son. Verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Then we have verse 7, I will show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. So this is a very important situation here for King David. Now, some of you will remember that Jonathan and David made a covenant together that in spite of everything, through thick and thin, 
they would remain loyal to each one, to both, both each other. But we know that, of course, Jonathan passed away, and I believe that this was part of the covenant. This was part of David showing his loyalty to his covenant, his promise, his agreement with his best friend. And so he blessed a member from the house of Saul. So David and Jonathan made this commitment. Through their spirituality, they were one, and through brotherhood. And together they made this covenant. You can find this covenant in 1 Samuel 18.3. Mephibosheth received the blessing, the results of this covenant. Jonathan's name in the Hebrew is Yohanathan, which means Jehovah has given. So God the Father and Jesus made a covenant of grace in heaven. In other words, they agreed that redemption, a redemption plan would already be in the works if something happened on this earth. They were already ready for that plan. They made that agreement in heaven and the Holy Spirit. Now God the Father and Jesus made this covenant together that Jesus would be a gift for the world and the world would be blessed through the birth of Jesus Christ which, and his death as well. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And this world, people do not realize how blessed they are for that covenant promise. Now Mephibosheth was saved for Jonathan's sake, but we are saved for Jesus' sake. Jonathan's spiritual oneness with David and his blood relationship with Mephibosheth enabled him to receive the king's blessing. Jesus also has a divine oneness with his Father in heaven. And a bloodline with who? with us, through his humanity. That can never be broken, which enables us to receive the blessing of Christ's righteousness. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, and we'll look at we have some time here. Maybe we'll go through uh, verse 9. Or verse, uh, verse 9 to verse 14. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory, or unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You can't get any more clear than that concerning the bloodline. Jesus had our human nature. It states not just a partaker of flesh and blood, but he also himself likewise took part of the same. So he's being redundant here. You know what's interesting too, is I looked at this in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I thought this was interesting, and I used the uh, Textus Receptus, and I looked at an interlinear Bible and looked at the English and the Greek, and it reads a little different because it's glossed. So it's just a literal translation. But you can hear the redundancy where Paul's trying to get the point across, Christ had our humanity. 
And it goes something like this. Since then, the little boys and girls, so instead of children, it uses boys and girls, has participated of flesh and blood. Also, he very nigh has partaken of the same. See how he's, he's being redundant there. Also, um, he's making the analogy just as the children, and he's, the, the Greek word is referring to children, right? Boys and girls. So we are blessed, and I, I think we don't realize how blessed we are that Jesus has made this connection between his Father and us through Christ's humanity. Amen. In fact, in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 244, it states, The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a real man. This truly demonstrates our heavenly king's love. And just like David, King David, blessed Mephibosheth and told him, you're going to sit continually at my table and eat with me and drink with me and you're going to have a part of my heavenly kingdom, we can do that as well and be ready to partake in that heavenly kingdom and eat with Jesus and dwell with Jesus in heaven. Amen. But before we do that, we can sup with Jesus here through the Holy Spirit, can't we? Amen. Let's finish with Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. So here's an appeal to us. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It states, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So is Christ referring here and John's writings to heaven, spending time with Jesus in heaven, or spending time with him here? Both, Both right? Amen. So we, we have to spend time with Jesus here in prayer with the Holy Spirit and Bible study. Christ did it for us. He did it in our humanity. We just follow his steps. We cannot follow his steps if we don't read the Bible and learn about Jesus. And how often should we do this? on a daily basis and allow the Holy Spirit to probe our hearts, let us know where there's some idols here and there, and we can be idol breakers as well through the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's close with prayer. Dearest Father in heaven, we cannot be grateful enough for the wonderful gift that you have poured out of heaven for our benefit, Lord, for our redemption. And we thank you that we can see a type of these elements in 2 Samuel chapter 9, this beautiful story of the blessings that Mephibosheth received from King David, Lord, and their bond, the bond of King David and Jonathan. And we thank you for this bond that you have, Lord, with your son and the bond that your son has with us. Please help us to allow your spirit to work in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.
be seated. 